Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now then, the threat to the steel industry, as we've been hearing with many thousands of potential job losses, has brought the idea of nationalisation back into currency. It's being championed by Labour, and I'm joined now by the Shadow Chancellor, John MacDonald. Welcome. Well, you have talked about nationalise to stabilise. What does that mean? Well, let me just be absolutely clear what we have said. We've got to give a clear way forward for the workers themselves and for, the, for our country and get the best deal for the taxpayers as well. So we've said we need to talk to Tata, the existing owners, to get a realistic timetable to see if we can find another buyer. If we can find another buyer, it's got to be not an asset stripping job. We've got to have some guarantees, keeping Port Talbot open, for example. If we haven't got that leeway in the timescale, well then as a fallback, yes, nationalise in the short term to stabilise the situation, prepare the sector then for putting it back out to another buyer. That will give us the stability that we need within the sector. We're also saying, yeah. though, we've got to get a level playing field. That You've means got to go back to Europe and, we've and got get those to, tariffs look, up. We've got to. I'm afraid we've been let down by our own government on this one. And, and actually, that was one of the issues that Tata actually said prompted them then to come to a decision to look at closure. We've got to get a level playing field. We yeah. also expected more support in the budget on business rates from George Osborne. That never happened. We've also got to bring forward the infrastructure projects as part of an industrial strategy. And what about We've, energy prices? Well, that's again, a big issue. we've looked at that again. We need to look at energy prices. We've given some support, but on the figures that we've seen, the issues around climate change or energy price increase has only been about 1%. So it's not the key factor, but it does need looking again. Finally, okay. we, we know we've got to restructure the industry and the company. The workforce and management can do that, working with their customers, but there needs to be state involvement to there secure needs to be the a future. Pause. Okay, so but what, what we know at the moment is that Tata have said basically that the, the, the whole thing will close, you know, the, it will go cold, the workers will leave, the electricity will be shut off in six week, six weeks maximum. So it's a very short time scale. We also know that they've been looking for buyers for a year and they haven't found anybody yet. There are two potential buyers being talked about in the paper. One is Sajiv Gupta. Um, and he's talking about not asset stripping but cherry picking. He doesn't want the blast furnaces, for instance. Would that be an acceptable option for Labour? I think we've got to look at all the options on the table itself. Part of the reason that buyers have not been coming forward is because they've not seen industrial strategy in this country that depends upon steel. If we, as a, if we were in government now, we would have an industrial strategy. We'd be working with potential buyers who had the confidence then about investment. That's why I'm saying bring forward the shovel-ready infrastructure projects because they will then see that there's a role so for steel in this country. go faster with HS2, for instance. Exactly, and a number of other projects. We've estimated there's about 35 billion of shovel-ready projects that can be brought forward. My worry mm. is that since since 2010, only about one in five projects has actually gone on to the ground yeah. for completion. Yeah. That's not acceptable. We need better delivery on infrastructure, but part of an industrial strategy. I guess the problem is that if you take it into public ownership while you wait for a buyer, and a buyer doesn't come on, then the public are going to be left with this, costing a million pounds a well, day at the moment, possibly in perpetuity. Look, Andrew, we know there's, there's a, this isn't a zero-cost exercise. If it closes now, we could be into a cost of 1 to 1.5 billion a year just supporting people on welfare benefits, the collapse of local economies. We saw it over mining. We mustn't allow, we must not desert these communities. We need an industrial strategy that encourages buyers to come forward. If we have to nationalise in the short term, fine, but that would be on the basis of securing the future of the industry. If you have to nationalise in the short term and that leads to full-scale nationalisation, in your view, would that be a big problem? I think what we need to do is recognise that the best way forward would be to secure a buyer in this, as quickly as we possibly can. I don't think we'll secure a buyer unless they see a government with an industrial strategy that's confident about the role of steel and infrastructure developments in the future. If we get that, we'll get a buyer. It's all about timescales now. One of the things that people say is that buyers are put off by the sheer size at the moment, the disproportionate size of the pension scheme. Do you think the government should, as it were, nationalise the pension scheme to make the blast furnaces and so forth more sellable? Well, 
the responsibilities for the pension scheme will be there anyway because we have a protection scheme nationally mm. within this country so those costs will be there anyway but that's part of the negotiations with Tata we can't let Tata walk away from its responsibilities that yeah. would be part of the detailed negotiations some people will say there they go again there's there's old labor first instinct nationalized it'll be steel first well, railways next buses and so you, forth and before we know where we are it's back to 1963 well, you haven't listened to me then what I've mm. said is that we need negotiations with Tata to get a realistic timetable for a new buyer. Hopefully a new buyer will come forward. If it isn't, nationalisation will be a fallback to prepare then for then bringing the buyer forward. expect to put it back into the market after I that. I believe so, but we might want to say that there's a public stake there for the long-term future to give us that security. It depends on the levels mm. of investment. But look, so, railway so franchises so have collapsed and yeah. they've been brought back into public ownership by this government yeah. and then put out again. So it does work. So, for instance, if um, a group like Liberty wanted to buy the downstream steel, the more specialist steel making, but didn't want to buy the blast furnaces, the, the, the original bit that's losing such a lot of money, it might be something for the state to hang on to the blast furnace bit in order to keep the entire steel industry alive in the private sector. I'd like, to see, I'd like to see a comprehensive development overall, a strategic development linked to our industrial strategy for the long term. In that way, I think we can secure the long term health, not just of steel, but our economy as well. We'll but look at we'll specifically look at, that, we'd, that proposal. We'd, we'd have to look at all options and see what's best for the workers, the taxpayers and the country overall. We've got to look for a long-term future. This is our new politics, the strategic entrepreneurial state engaging, creating long-term state patient investment, new products, new markets, and in that way, sharing the prosperity so we could of the have a we could have a long-term steel industry partly owned by the taxpayer, partly owned by private groups. We'll look at all the options. My worry under the government is that we've had disarray. Mm. Anna Subri, the minister, only a few days ago, said all options are on the table. The next day, the Secretary of State said nationalisation, yeah. we refused yeah. to accept mm. that. They, they were in disarray, so, complete disarray. One other option that's being talked about this morning is the German group Tyson Krupp, and it's thought that they would like to buy uh, a lot of Tata's European operations, including the very, very modern yeah. Dutch plant, in order to shut down Port Talbot. What would you say to them this morning? I think for any new buyer, we'd have to have a guarantee about Port Talbot continuing and maintaining. And Port Talbot workforce have looked at restructuring. They can become competitive again. But again, it has to be linked to an overall industrial strategy mm. in this country. And government has a role to play in this. However we look at it, whether it's money well spent or not, Labour's response to this does involve a huge extra burden on the public purse, no. doesn't it? Everybody's responsible. If the government allows our steel sector to close now, Port Talbot to close, it could cost us between 1 and 1.5 billion to keep people on the dole and have economies collapse in those communities. There's no cost-free option here, so what we need to do is make sure we invest the money so that we can turn that round, make the sector profitable mm. again. We will need steel in the future if we're going to rebuild our manufacturing base. And in that way, actually, at the end of the day, we believe we'll get the best deal for the taxpayer, the community and the workforce. All right. Let me move, if I may, to one Labour Party issue. Yeah. There's been a lot of Labour Party stuff in the news recently. But above all, fears that the party has an anti-Semitic fringe. Yeah, just... And there are, there are people, um, including Chris Bryant, your own MP, the, 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 the chairman of the board of British Jewish Deputy, who just says that we are uneasy about some of the... Yeah. So my question is this. Um, there is a principal position of opposition to the Israeli government and what it's been doing, and that can involve boycotts and so forth. At what point, in your mind, does anti-Zionist politics start to bleed into anti-Semitism? Where is the dividing line? As soon as Jewish people start telling us that there is anti-Semitism in our party, we've got to sit up and listen. That's why I said last week, if there are people who have expressed anti-Semitic views, there's no role for them in our party, and I'd like them out of our party for life, to be frank. I, I believe what we should do is take the advice of the British Board of Deputies and our other Jewish friends as well to say how do we tackle this problem because it's a societal problem and it's, it's, it's infected. It infects the Labour Party but it infects society generally. Yes, but if it's infected any of our Labour Party, we've got to root it out and I'm not having it within our party. So people, I mean there's, there's one example, there's a, I think a councillor, a Labour councillor who talked about Jewish people <coughs> um, being, being very aggressive towards Palestinians and all having big noses, that oh, kind of thing. Unaccept completely that is unacceptable. Yeah. You can be a critic of the Israel Israeli state and its role, but you mustn't allow that to any way be used by anti-Semites. We've got to root that out, and we will do. John McDonnell, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning.